The Survivalist Podcast with Mark Puhale and Matt Gould. In each episode of The Survivalist Podcast, we look at different events and catastrophes that could happen in different areas of the world. Then we give you the knowledge, resources, and recommendations you need to survive. We'll explore scenarios from a worldwide financial collapse to a coordinated terrorist attack to a global climate catastrophe and everything in between. Please visit our website, thesurvivalistpodcast.com, for more information or to give us feedback. And now, The Survivalist Podcast with Mark Puhale and Matt Gould. Welcome to The Survivalist Podcast. I'm Matt Gould. I'm here with Mark Puhale and Doc Montana. We also have a guest with us today, Tim Ralston, who is a uh, very famous prepper inventor. And uh, he's come up with a lot of great tools that people love. And and we're going to start off by talking about that. Um, So welcome, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Tim, do you want to tell us more of a bio of yourself than I just gave? Well, you know, uh, first of all, I, you know, I always get the, the expert thing thrown out at at uh, the introductions, which is the one thing I can't stand uh, when someone calls himself an expert, because that's about the first time you fail. And uh, you never know enough in survival. You're, if you're not learning, you're dying. So I'm I'm always that uh, that guy that thinks, OK, if I'm not practicing it, I'm going to go out there and find something new. There's always something to be learned when it comes to survival. And so that's kind of what I what I do and what I practice. You know, I hope for the best and plan for the worst, and and kind of that's kind of me in a nutshell. And along the way, I tend to uh, you know solve problems. I'm a kind of a out of the box thinker, so that's kind of where all these inventions kind of, uh, for me just keep popping up. And uh, it's just to make it easier for myself. And you know, if they catch on and other guys like them, then that's great. But you know, it's uh, the mother of necessity is kind of what drives me. And so it's once you go out there and do it enough times, you try to find shortcuts to make it easier, not harder. So, Tim, uh, tell us yeah. about your inventions and start with the uh, earliest ones and then work up to the yeah. stuff you're working on now. Sure. Um, well, my probably my earliest one, the one that a lot of people know about, <clears throat> is called the Crowville. It's a uh, half crowbar, half shovel, all business. You know, it's just one of those things that, uh, you know, my dad gave me a World War II shovel that, um, you know, I kind of cherish because he's, he's passed on now. And uh, the handle broke, so I wound up saying, well, I don't want to ever have that happen. Found a crowbar, had my neighbor weld it uh, to the head, and I go, man, we should make these things. And that's kind of what happened. I started to make them and guys really loved it because it combined, you know, two really good survival tools into one. So multi-tools kind of became my thing. And, and from there I've done, um, survival watches, the recon six watch. Um, I've done uh, an Excalibur, which is kind of unique. I kind of crossed over into, um, the, the edge weapons to firearms and that basically took your single shot 12 gauge and turned it into 10 different rifles. Um, so that, that one kind of took off as well, um, just last year and it's being launched worldwide now. So, um, you know, from that point, it's again, as many times as I can combine more tools into one, um, uh, that made sense to me. I did uh, another tool called the Nax. It's kind of a knife ax combination. Um, but the latest one that I just came out with, it's called the Timahawk. I know it's kind of corny, but it'll be remembered because of the name. Uh, that was actually my favorite tool that I've that I've come up with, um, as far as when I've been testing it and and the usefulness of it. It's basically taking uh, an axe, which you can't go out in the wilderness or bushcraft without a, a good axe, a pry bar, which is again a staple when you're in an urban environment, or you know even out in the wilderness, a, a good you know, pry bar really helps and, and adds an ADZ, um, chipping tool. Um, I use that as a digger, a bowl maker, um, you know, and, and if I want to save my ax blade, I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing about chopping down, you know, trees and everything. So it's just a good combination, good steel, um, kind of, uh, more Viking style, um, uh, 
design so that you can actually hold it up at the very top of the uh, axe blade and still have control. So if I didn't have a knife, I could still use it, you know, to do fine work. So it works out really, really well. And you could crack someone's skull if you had to. Hey, well, if the zombie apocalypse happens, yeah, that could definitely That's help. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you know, but Mark Puhali was uh, in the Marine Corps for almost 14 years. And um, so whenever I have a question about safety or security, uh, I, I ask it to Mark because I'm obsessed with that as well. <laughs> well, it's intimidating. This uh, tool is nice, big and bright and orange so when you when you're holding it people see it and uh it's it's an intimidating uh weapon and it can be thrown i know mean, people are like it's big but it's balanced and when it when i throw it i have some videos of me throwing this thing not that i ever recommend throwing your tool at anyone because if you do miss then they have the tool to come at you with so as a mm-hmm. safety thing i don't think they, they don't really recommend that um, it's always good for the movies, but, uh, you know, for fun, I love to throw it and it hits so hard cause it's so big, you know, it, I mean, it's mm-hmm. four pounds of solid steel. So when that gets coming, that's that force multiplier when it hits you. So it's, it's pretty cool. It's an impressive I, tool. I look at that as like my first impression is like an ice ax or again, I'm thinking, uh, medieval stuff like me wielding a pair of these things with a lanyard on them and, um, you know, going in the oh, room yeah. to, uh, to fight someone and or ward someone off uh, in a, you know, in a bad situation. If I don't have a firearm, I could have the Timahawk by my side and be like, okay, you want a piece of this? You're going to have to go through this bladed weapon that it does. It looks, it looks scary and it looks, it does. It looks yeah. light, and, light enough too compared to like a heavy ax or a sledgehammer that you could, you know, you could be pretty, um, I'm thinking like a Cali fighting stick, but with a blade on it. You could like really yeah. uh, intimidate the we hell have out of actually, Yeah, we actually have a, a grip point up at the top of it. So when you grip it, um, it's actually like having a, a brass knuckle. It, it's kind of the easiest way to describe it. So if you did get in a close quarter, you could punch with it, and you're punching with a six-inch blade at the end of your knuckles. And, and then the back part of it is really kind of – like having, you know, a uh, swing and a crowbar at somebody with force. Yeah. I, I did a video where I hit a, a cow's bone. It was a shin bone of a cow. We, you know, mm-hmm. taped it to a, uh, a, a pallet and I just swung it around and not with full force either, but you know, you're, you're wheeling a three pound solid piece of steel when it hit the bone just shattered. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of those. Okay. And we are you know, going to be coming out with some fighting videos. Uh, you know, I'm not a, a knife fighting expert by any means. Um, I, it would be probably a crazy melee looking at somebody come at me, but um, we're going to actually get some professional knife fighters to get a hold of this and do some videos to teach people, you know, some basic moves. And we're going to come out with some plastic ones that are just like the real one, but all out of plastic. So you can actually um, purchase those as well. So you can practice without you know, having to cut your, your uh, opponent or get hurt yourself. Cut your, so you don't cut your balls off. Exactly. Huh. <laughs> and Tim, so that, Matt, Matt, did, we're free reign to say whatever we want on the podcast. We're oh, not, yeah. Uh, regulated, oh. We're not regulated by the, uh, what, the, the FTC or whatever the... Uh, yeah, no, we're... Uh, so you can, we can we say can what we want really. to say. So I see the, okay. I see the, neur- the neural portion, like I see the, the place what I would assume, you know, just um, uh, ergonomically to put my fist through, like at the top, the long axis of the... Uh, the Timahawk, and then I see the knurled portion at the front also um, mm-hmm. on the shaft that you could, I yeah. guess that's meant to be grabbed onto for better, like if you were trying to cut a tree or what have you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's two grip points. You got the one at the very tip top, and that's more for once you're trying to use the, the back end of it um, where the pry bar is. So if you're to jam it in there, um, you're not grabbing mm-hmm. the blade itself to try to, you know, get leverage. You've got that nice hand yeah. hold. And uh, it works out really, really well. I've been doing a ton of testing with it. And uh, I've got right now probably the experts of the experts of the experts all got shipped out their Timahawks. So I'm going to be getting some pretty great videos of guys that, you know, have great names in the industry that um, for survival, you know, and whether it's bushcraft, Mm -hmm. 
reality shows, you name it, you know, they, they're all going to be out there doing their own videos with it and uh, showing how it works for them. But it all, like I said, all these designs for me come out of necessity. I mean, I love axes, um, but the weak point, you know, when I design, you, 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 you always look at what are the strengths and then, okay, you, there's always weaknesses for every tool. So where's, where's the weak point? So after you get the top selling products, the favorite ones, then you do your little, you know, Franklin T before you know it, you've got, okay, here are all the weaknesses. Let's get rid of them. Here's all the strengths. Now let's build something from there. That's kind of how I, mm-hmm. I, uh, start redesigning and design for myself. But, you know, after you watch enough videos and see enough guys that are out there, you know, an ax is by far one of the, you know, the number one tools and digging is also great too. I mean, I, I, I can't, you know, use that, uh, ad enough when I'm out there and there isn't anything out there, um, that actually combines the two. So makes it unique. Mm-hmm. All right. Okay. Now it's time to take a break and thank one of our sponsors, Forge Survival Supply. Mark. Forge Survival Supply, the premier supplier of food storage, MREs, and survival gear. Is your family ready for an emergency? Shop today at ForgeSurvivalSupply.com. Now, yep. I, I'm very fascinated. I, I'm, I'm always fascinated with uh, firearms. My favorite part of survival cash, uh, dot com that I go to a lot is always the top 100 items to disappear first list. Uh, guns and ammunition are right there. So if there's a total shit hits the fan worldwide problem, what's going to happen in terms of firearms? Well, obviously, the uh, uh, in fact, I, <laughs> I just saw a news story today about uh, Ruger's stock going up quite fast because obviously people are starting to plan ahead. Um, but there's, I imagine, two forces that are going to be at work. One is obviously supply and demand, um, and people are going to uh, overbuy, and that's they can then, you know, sell, trade, pass on other firearms. So the the uh, individual consumer is going to greatly exceed their normal buying habits. But the second is probably going to be regulation down from the top, and I guess if you take models from other other um, uh, problems. There could be what if it's one gun a month per person? You know that's it. New new rule. All of a sudden, you know the the markets, you know, um, held in place or held in check by some other law. So I guess I I could imagine uh, um, things getting out of hand quite rapidly. Where mm-hmm. the, as soon as there are hints of that, you're going to be run into the gun store, just like we saw you know a number of years ago, and the shelves are bare. Yeah, you know, sure. Every, Get anything you want, um, you know, used guns tripling in value. Obviously, most of that came down, but um, you, you start to see the writing on the wall. So uh, there mm-hmm. could be the governmental forces, and there could be, you know, our own creation through um, scarcity. And either one of those, once they're gone, they're gone. Um, and that's where, you know, like as in Tim's um, uh, multi-caliber gun, you're going to start looking at variations where the ammo starts to drive the sales, and we did see that. Where you walk in, what ammo's on there? Oh, gee, 303 British. What do you got? 303 British. I'll take it, because the cost of the rifle or the pan gun now becomes almost insignificant if there's no ammo. So, right. I guess that would be a third force is what ammo's available. Well, and, and that's, what? that's that's what I was thinking about is ammo. I mean, it's a complicated mm-hmm. process to make ammunition, right? It's not something that you can make easily by yourself, is it? Uh, reload oh, it. Possible, but it's not not in volume. And then, of course, there's the, the the projectiles, the primers, and the powder that you know are also highly regulated. Right, and not only yeah, that, I, but in in time, I mean, in the last since since Obama's been in office, the rise or Obama since since politics have been the way they are with regards to gun control and all the things that have happened with mass shootings and everything else, the price of ammunition has significantly increased the price of weapons have increased and then the part the price of all of that reloading material like i reload um i reload both rifle and pistol ammunition and so like five years ago for me to get a thousand rounds of 45 ammo was 45 brass was i don't know under 50 dollars now it's almost a hundred dollars depending on the different types of of the brass that I would get for my forty five pistols. 
And so it's almost, yeah. it's gone off like twofold. And then another example is the 22, which we've talked about in a lot of uh, different survival scenarios, you know, what's the best caliber, but a 22, you could buy a brick of ammunition, 500 or a thousand rounds. That was under $20. Now it's between, it's typically like 25 to $40 for a brick of 500 rounds of 22 long rifle ammunition. And that's if you can uh, find it. <laughs> and if you can find it. Coded. Well, yeah, I, I, I definitely want to, I definitely want to chime in on this scenario because I've, since I've been doing trade shows and being out there, I mean, that and developed the last uh, weapon system that I did, I've actually increased it um, by six times. I think I've got a product that is like six times better. But from what you guys said, you're so on the money. It, it's going to come down. I tell the guys now, you know, I get prepper all day long call what what do i get what's the best gun i've asked that question five thousand times what's the ultimate survival rifle or gun right and if you ask five thousand guys you'll get five thousand different answers no one has a specific gun in mind because it's whatever you have available number one that you can get number two and find ammo for and when you look at the problem uh, of trying to decide what's the ultimate survival rifle um, each round or bullet or ammunition has a specific purpose. You know, I, I love the guys that say, oh, an AK-47 is the ultimate survival rifle. I'm like, seriously, tell me what animal you've been able to eat, you know, like a rabbit, if you shot it with an AK-47. What part of it <laughs> yeah. are you going to find to be able to eat? You know, so, you know, I'd rather have a 22 for that purpose. Um, but with that said, I, if there's bad guys coming at me, I definitely don't want to be able to have, um, um, I don't want to have a, uh, depending on a 22 to put down a foe. So um, I always tell the guys, the guy that uh, has the ammunition is going to be king, and it'll be the number one bartered product that's out on the marketplace. I mean, it'll be yeah, better wonderful. than gold and way better than gold, way better than silver. Um, you know, I tell people right now, ammo will be king if it ever really does hit the fan. So we, um, I sat down and, you know, after you round table it and talk to engineers, can it be done? We designed a, a gun called the scavenger six and basically take the same concept as the Excalibur and we put it in a revolver. So the frame is an anodized aluminum revolver base. So it's lightweight pounds equal pain when you're surviving. You don't want to carry around a you know, yep. 15 pound survival rifle. Cause you know, I'd rather carry more water than a big heavy rifle, but you got to be able to be accurate at least out to a hundred yards. Cause most confrontations are, are in close quarter battles and um, you got to be able to have diversity. So with one of my, what we call them CB cylinder barrels, the cylinder that normally just holds the round actually is the barrel. So with that, I can get kind of jiggy on what I bore out each cylinder barrel so one of our cylinder barrels has six shots, just like a revolver, but each one is calibrated for a different um, caliber. So one survival CB actually shoots eight different calibers. So I'm like putting eight guns in my back pocket. And then I have three other multi-caliber barrels for hunting, all the top uh, hunting rounds, and battle, all the top battle rifles. Then from there, if you want more firepower, you could get just a say I want a revolver with a 22, and if you want more firepower than you know that, then you say I want the cylinder barrel that's geared for the AK-47 round or a 223. Basically, any round that you're at, that that's on the market right now, and even if you have one that's like some crazy one, like uh, I don't know your seven millimeter Mauser weapon, you know that your grandpa gave you. The gun doesn't work, but you have tons of ammo. You send bullets to us, we'll turn around and bore it out, and now you'll get to use that ammunition. So we can now claim that we can shoot just about every caliber that's out there. And um, so it's all about vers- versatility and adapting. And for that, if your four-pound gun can adapt to any type of caliber. So that kind of you know puts a, a fine point to what could be the ultimate survival rifle. Um, it would be that, but you know, it's only as good as the shooter that's, that's uh, pulling the trigger for sure. If you can hit anything. Yeah. Right. And like you said, Oh, so go ahead. ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to, 
Go ahead, Doc, and then I'll talk. So I was just going to put a, a even finer point on the idea of why the ammo side is so critical. I've read a lot of bug out bag <laughs> lists, and I have never seen reloading equipment on them. And there's a reason for that. So uh, yeah. you really will be, once you're on the move, you have to use pre-prepared ammo. You cannot make it. Yep. You can't reload it. You're scavenging. Yeah. That's exactly right. Go ahead. But, you know, yeah, I'll tell you what. If, if you went to every farmhouse between here and Kansas City, and, uh, you know, if you found an abandoned barn or abandoned house and you kicked open the door, I guarantee you, you're going to, if there's a gun in that house, you're going to find remnant ammo everywhere. I mean, I could probably look in Doc's sock door and probably find uh, a couple of different uh, one or two pieces, you know, that's just lying around. And with my system, you're picking those up. Those are valuable at that point. So it's at least you're still in the fight and you can still keep going um, with whatever you find. That's the whole thought pattern for sure. Yeah, I that's that's good stuff. I, I just want to say that. Um, so this first part, we we're talking specifically about stuff that uh, Tim invented. And so obviously I mean, it's great stuff, Tim, but obviously you have a vested interest and. I, I want to just move past. I want to move to another area now where we just talk about other gear, and you guys can tell tell us what you think. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, just um, for any listeners wondering, this would be the the unbiased portion, I guess, of the podcast where we're talking about stuff uh, that that we don't make, right? All right, you guys, let's take a break and hear a little bit about another one of our sponsors from Mark, the Perry Blade Survival Knife. Designed by legendary British SAS soldier Mel Perry. The Perry Blade Survival Knife is the definitive working blade in a survival situation. Get yours today. When I talk to preppers, knives is the very first thing that everybody wants to talk about. Am I right in thinking that? Knives? The, uh, no. oh, yeah, yeah it, it would be at the top. Um, and, you know, after you go through a, a lot of them, uh, and try to find which one fits, which one works. Um, you know, size really isn't a big issue for me. It's smaller knives tend to work the best. They're the most maneuverable and easy. Um, but with that said, um, if I had a choice between uh, a good knife or a multi-tool, um, I'd pick multi-tool. You know, a good multi-tool has so many things that you can do with it and the knife on them. You know, good one. Um, Leatherman makes really great ones. Gerber make great ones as well. But, you know, it's very versatile. But, yeah, you've got to have a knife to be able to, to, to you know, to survive. But with that said, it's all about education uh, for me. Um, you know, a good bushcraft guy can make his own knife out of, a you know, obsidian rock. So, you know, it's all about getting the skills. So practice, practice, practice. That's what's going to make it in the long run. Gear is, is as good as what you can find or, or get, you know, it's, I had one guy, a really great instructor that, um, does a class and it's all about fire shelter, you know, the, the basics of survival. And you have a lot of these gadget guys, kind of like myself, come to his class and he as have you empty your pockets and he goes who can start fires and of course i you know you pull out oh i've got a lighter it's the easiest way another guy brings out a feral rod and then he grabs them all and throws them in the river says great you just lost everything now what are you going to do and you're like oh okay now you got to learn how to do friction fires so i tell everyone you got to get educated and there's you know, lots of schools out there and people that are teaching it, um, the basics, those are always really good. Yeah. So, um, Mark, what do you think? Knives, uh, obviously they're good for, you can use them for food and for creating shelter and for protection, right? Am I missing any uses for the knife? Um, and making shelter. I mean, the knife, I think we can all agree is it's, if you don't have one in your survival kit, you're, you you don't know what the hell you're doing. I mean, that's just one of the tenets <laughs> exactly. of that 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 has to, uh, some type of cutting tool has to be in there, or you have the knowledge, like Tim said, to to make some type of cutting tool out of a rock or maybe debris, you know, an aluminum can or steel or something you find mm-hmm. in the environment you're in. So if you don't have one, or if you lose your knife, and like we always say. You know, one is none, and two is just getting started for redundancy. Um, mm-hmm. Ideally, you know, I have a nice, I have a nice big knife that I could potentially chop down a tree to build a shelter, or make a spear, or make a trap, 
with. And then I have a multi-tool that I can, for the finer things, I could maybe pry stuff open with a screwdriver. Maybe there's scissors on there. Maybe there's a little saw. Maybe there's a file. You know, I'm thinking of a, a Leatherman or something like that. But um, I think it's absolutely, you have to have it for survival. And with that, I again, with for me being a survival dude or even a Marine, I'm thinking the whole outdoor thing. Like, what do I need? I need a I need a pack to carry my shit in. Then I need a knife as a tool, potentially a firearm. I need something for fire. I need something for water. I, see, I need some type of food or some type of means to get food. I need a means to communicate or protect myself or signal. I, I'm, I'm always thinking about food, fire, shelter, water, and then like communication, signaling, security. Um, security mm-hmm. in the forms of early warning or protecting myself and protecting the people who are with me. Yeah. And, yeah, and Doc, do you have a, a favorite kind of knife you use, or do you just use whatever comes to hand, or is it different for different scenarios? Oh, I've got many favorites. Uh, one that I just uh, uh, did a review on, hasn't published yet, but will soon, is on the uh, Falkneven A1 Pro. It's a brand new super survival knife. Um, just amazing. But two things I wanted to add regarding the knives. One is the you really need some basic skills on how to keep the blade sharp. Um, a lot of folks, mm-hmm. to, you know, run them into the ground and then, you know, look for a new knife. The second thing is proper ways to hold it and, and use it. Because if you really are in a bad situation, I mean, a bug out, you don't have a, an ambulance coming. And I watched a lot of people, and they're like slicing towards their arteries and their legs, or they're pulling towards themselves. And, you know, one slip up, you know, because you're cold or you're scared or your hands are wet or bloody, and you're going to end up, you know, taking yourself out. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, operating the tomahawk as well it can be just as dangerous for the user if you're kind of clueless um so spend a little time on that but yeah i like the larger i like large survival knives you know something in the the eight inch blade can i add to that doc i I want to second that with um like any piece of like joel has said and we've said in the show you know the mall ninja right um, yeah. so me being a, I was a student officer at the basic school where all Marine officers get trained and compete for their job choice. And so I'm not going to mention this Marine's name, but this Marine went to the U S Naval Academy, had no experience with knives. And so he got like a Gerber's, they sell them on base. I don't know what they're selling nowadays, but you know how we all like to with a locking blade knife, we like to open it maybe a third of the way or a quarter of the way and then flick our knives to open it up and hear that cool clicking sound and, oh, I'm a badass. I got a badass new knife. You guys, you know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. So this genius stabs himself in his thigh from opening <laughs> up his brand, new, his brand new knife because it slipped out of his hand and he stabbed himself. And um, needless to say... I remember that to this day, and um, it's like if you – if whatever great piece of gear you have, if it's going to be in your pack, in your everyday carry, on your body, in your car, whatever, you have to be able to – you have to be familiar with it. You have to know how to employ it. You have to know the nuances of it for you and your body and, and how that shit works so you don't hurt yourself. And this yeah. – um, yeah. Yeah. So – Anyway, sorry. Very, very good. My two points on that. So, um, moving along. So, I, I talk about. Uh, so, we talk about food, water, fire, safety, shelter. Right? Are those the those are the five things. I had navigation in there too. Navigation, yes. So, mm-hmm. I always think about food. You know, I think of a lot of um, just from doing that show we did together, Apocalypse One Hundred and One, and all the different preppers I met. I get the feeling that if it, it, a lot of people. If they didn't have their, you know, freeze dried food, they would starve to death because it's very hard to catch something to eat, as far as I can tell. And any time I've tried, it's very, very difficult. So, what what about tools mm-hmm. for that? What do you what kind of gear do you guys like for that? Um, for for myself, yeah, I, you, you hit it right on the head. You know, I love the guys that, you know, that go out there and. Uh, you know, they, they don't have any freeze dry food. I think, well, if it hits the fan, I'm just going to go hunt up in the mountains. And if you've ever been out on the mountains, 
especially here in Arizona. Um, I did a trip just recently in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. There it was probably the only place that I've ever seen in my life that there were game. Everywhere you turned, there was game that you could hunt and kill. It was amazing up there. But here in Arizona, forget about it. You could go for weeks and not see a squirrel or rabbit, anything. Uh, up in the mountains, all of those small critters all gravitate down to the valley where all the grass is and the water and everything else. But in a, an apocalypse scenario, that will be hunted out in seconds. Um, you know, and getting your eyes on a critter is going to be the hardest thing. Um, so hunting really has to be more trapping. So I think if it were left up to me, I would rather go out with a whole bunch of snare wire and traps and set 20 or 30 of those and then go back to the camp, sit down and wait and then check them the next day. I think that makes more sense uh, to conserve your calories and energy. And, you know, it's that you're multiplying yourself 20 times um, because they're, they're wanting to stay alive just as well as you are. So they're a lot better at hearing and sensing that you're coming to hide and you're never even going to see them. This way, that snare wire is going to do all the work for you. So snare wire to me is probably one of the best hunting tools that you can get. And Tim, with that being said, with regard to snares, why don't you talk about like some of your decision criteria with, with, um, with making a, a snare, like where you would mm -hmm. put a snare, um, how sure. you would conceal your scent with a snare, and then the fact that um, – Snare is, it's, it's wire, so it's, again, like you said, weight is pain, so you could have a lot of redundancy with wire and make a lot of traps without mm -hmm. carrying a thousand rounds of ammo. Could you, so could you touch on that, like for the listeners? On, sure. Um, yeah. yeah. Decision cards? Yeah. I got, I got really lucky, um, and uh, I bought out a, a gentleman's entire survival store and i came across this wire and i know you can find the wire out there but for me it just is amazing it, it was a a communications cord they used to use in uh, the vietnam war right they would have it, it, it hooks to your belt and there's like a quarter mile in one little little it's about the size of a dinner plate it's it was it's an amazing yeah it's for using it's for running um it's for running secure phone lines like in the defense. Yeah, exactly. You know, you, yeah, you put the fastest it, it, guy and say run. And, yeah, it's and so Walmart. I use that. It's, yeah, it's black and it's double, it's coated and it's just amazing. And it it mm -hmm. uh, is really super strong and it's dark in color so the animals don't pick it up as easy when you see it. But, you know, for creating the snare, it's, you know, putting it at the right level where you think, you know, is it a rabbit? Are we talking bigger game? You put it up a little higher, but you're, you know, you're looking for signs, looking for scat, you're looking, you know, uh, the poop, whatever on the ground, and you're looking for the trails. I mean, rabbits, mm -hmm. squirrels, they all are creatures of habit and they'll run the same pattern all the time. And so if you see that, okay, that's nice and worn down, that's where I'm putting my, my snare. And it's usually all going towards some kind of watering hole or a den. So, you you know, you look for those signs and, uh, you know, pop them up. You wouldn't put it down in the middle of nowhere where there's nothing because chances are it's not going to be um, going to catch you anything. So you're going to look for cover. You know, you got to kind of think like the prey that you're going after. Um, I, I need some shade here. In the, you know, I'm speaking about Arizona. It's always for us. It's always shade. You know, animals are just like us. It's like, get out of the sun. So you're looking for the shade. You're looking for the green, the, the vegetation, um, the, where the moisture would be, because that's where everybody's going to be going. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, that's when we're out there in the desert and you're trying to find water, you know, you watch the doves in the morning and the evening. They're flying in one direction always. Follow those guys, because that's where they're heading. It's for their their nightly drink of water, and they know where it's at. They have the bird's eye view. So, you know, just learning to read nature is probably the easiest way to, to get yourself lucky out there. Mm -hmm. So for, like, the takeaways, so you got to be in the bush, and you have to be aware of your environment, and then you have to think like the animal, i.e. Mm -hmm. game trails, worn-down trails, places where they would um, – camouflage themselves or like you said they're going to get water in the morning and night right. more than likely and so exactly. and then what type of um what type of snares are you making are you making a simple snare like a like a noose 
or are you making a yeah, loose stuff like a deadfall? no i've tried the the dead I, I i do like deadfall traps for smaller game um it they're a lot harder to to actually build a deadfall trap we actually used to carry a, a product at our store um, called the df4 and it was a guy who uh, a marine that that uh, put it together and it was made out of aluminum and you could set up the deadfall trap in like two seconds, put bait, mm-hmm. wire it on and find just a big flat rock. And I all in my pack, I always carry six of those and they weigh nothing. Mm-hmm. And to set up deadfall traps where I'm at, I'm just looking for flat rocks and bam, they're set up. But, um, just a nice loose snare. Um, uh, so when they go through their head, will go through it. And then the body catches it, their legs, and then that noose just tightens up close around their neck and they struggle. It just gets tighter and tighter. And of course, that uh, snare is tied to a really solid anchor, whether I stake it or, you know, a tree that's nearby. Um, Mm It's usually the most effective one. And you can do the same thing, you know, for um, that same snare scenario with uh, a, uh, a perch, you know, you just do little smaller ones and do like a dozen along a branch. And then uh, as those little quail come up to roost, they're going to want to see that branch. Oh, it's a great place to roost. And you hope as they move, they hook their leg and you got another one that way. Mm-hmm. In theory, that's the way it's supposed to work. Has it worked for me that way? No, nah. no. Nah. Dead fall trap all the time. That worked really well. Mm-hmm. Right. That, yeah. Well, that, that brings up a question for me because Am I am I right in thinking snares are illegal in certain states? Is that right? I've been told that they are, but in a survival situation, if you're in a survival situation, it's all fair game. Well, if you're going out there just to do it, I mean, so. No, I fully agree with you. In a survival, in an apocalypse situation, survival situation, you know, obviously you're going to do what needs to be done. But how do you practice? You know, how do you how do you find out how to make a snare that works if it's not legal where you live? I think some of the legality has to do with what land you you are using it on, whether it's federal land, state land, private land, um, and also how far it is maybe from public access points. I know around here the the trapping becomes kind of a hot topic, and um, you know whether or not it's reasonable that somebody's dog or kid is going to wander into what you've done. Um, so as far as trying it, uh, you know I. I don't endorse breaking any laws, but you might be able to, just like you could use a mouse trap or a rat trap, just the, the snap ones. Um, we have mm-hmm. mole traps with big spikes. We've got, you know, lots of different things. I don't see the difference between those and setting up a, a snare unless you are catching songbirds or or um, game species out of season. Yeah, right. But for a lot of for squirrels and things like that, rabbits, I don't know if there's any any rules around here. Yeah, and then lastly, I think I mentioned before, um, sense of smell with the animals. How do you try not to get human smell on your wires? Because that could be that could stop an animal right from them going in that direction if they smell us. Right. Um, I've always been uh, told um, that you know before you're going. I mean, I would wear my gloves um, when I'm going to set the snare. But before I take off to go set them, you know, atypically I'd be at my campsite. So I would just smoke them. Um, So Mm -hmm. I would just hold it over the smoke and uh, allow the smoke to get rid of the human scent. And, you know, the smoke is going to help disguise that as much as it can. I thought you should pee on them. That's a joke. (laughs) (laughs) Well, actually, you can use someone else's pee, you know, or wipe deer poop or something all over it. Yeah, yeah. Careful, because if you use coyote pee, that gives the wrong message, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. Let's take one more break to thank another one of our sponsors, Mark. Tecton Breath of Life fits in your pocket, purse, or briefcase. The Tecton Breath of Life gives you 15 to 20 minutes of breathing time to allow you to escape from a biological attack or burning building without inhaling fumes or toxins. This product is made in Israel, where the danger of attack is real every day, so you know it works. Only thirty nine ninety nine from Ford Survival Supply or on Amazon. Yeah, and I'll second that, Mark. I mean, everybody thinks, oh, come on, you can't carry stuff around. You can't carry everything around and be ready for everything. But, you know, breathing is really the very most important thing. If you can't breathe, you can't escape. You can't survive. 
Uh, all right, so water, probably the next... So water's probably the, the first most important thing, now that I think about it, before knives and snares and guns and everything. It's probably water, right? Because that's going to kill you the yep. fastest. So what, yep, that's going to kill you the quickest. So tell me, tell us about water gear. Water, you know, what what do you need? Well, I can I, throw it on, in on this one if you want. The the gear I use are uh, um, several different layers of filters plus um, pills plus knowing some some good streams. Um, I obviously everything's off in the city, but I think in, as far as the filters go, you use the the one proportionate to the kind of stuff you need to remove unless you can you know, run to the REI and buy a new filter. And the reason is the more debris or the more toxins, the faster the filter will clog. Um, so a lot of people have life straws and or Sawyers or others, and you know they're good for umpteen hundred gallons. But if you're mm -hmm. in really bad conditions, no, they're not gonna last that long. They're gonna get very tough to, uh, you know, to suck through and you're gonna have trouble storing water because basically you have to spit it back in the water bottle because it's a straw, um, but it's a great fast option. Um, the other thing that uh, kind of on the side of this is you, you aren't going to probably get sick immediately. So sometimes you have to weigh, um, you know, I'm, I might get sick in a couple days. This isn't good water, but I'm going to be two days further away and maybe in a safer location. So you have to prioritize, you know, the, the escape plan rather than being dehydrated where you could pass out or get sunstroke or something else, you're going to just put off getting sick for a bit. Um, and then some yeah. of the other toxins are, you know, they have to take a lifetime of, you know, like lead or heavy metals, you know, you're slow. You, when you're in your fifties, you're going to start shaking or something if you are drinking bad water in your thirties. So you have to prioritize that. Um, yeah. And so what kind of other gear do you recommend for it? I mean, Mark, uh, on the show one time, Mark showed us how to uh, make a crude filter out of stuff you could find. Mm -hmm. Yeah, make a, make a, um, like a hasty filter with, um, with charcoal. a sock or shirt. Sh yep. Charcoal, sand, rocks. Um, but charcoal specifically, you know, a carbon filter, all these store-bought filters, um, not all of them, but they have carbon or they have a, a micron filter, like a small filter to remove um, microorganisms and or particulates. And uh, like Doc said, if I, uh, I mean, we've probably, we've probably seen this or the listeners have seen this on, um, on TV. If you come to a, you know, a, a shitty body of water and if you dig a hole adjacent to it, that hole is likely going to fill up with water that should be filtered from the surrounding ground and area next to the larger body of water. Um, now, I'm ruling out salt water, too. Um, but in some instances, you can get fresh water by salt water. But for the purpose of this, if there's big debris and there's particulates and all this shit in the water, you want to give it some time to settle and then remove the top layer debris. And then you could make a filter with like I said, the shirt on your back to remove crap that's in the water. And then you could go down from there with, again, with rocks, with sand, with smaller rocks, bigger rocks, charcoal mm -hmm. to filter something else. But if there's poison in the water, charcoal, you know, a hasty charcoal filter may not take chemical, a chemical pollutant out of the water. It could, um, just like a small micron filter for uh, microorganisms, it might not take heavy metals and other stuff potentially out of, you know, poisonous water. Heavy, heavy alkaline or salt is, um, is not going to get out of there. Yeah. And even from, I, I, um, you're, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. And um, what we haven't mentioned too is some means to carry it. You know, what, what kind of container are you going to have either to carry the water in to boil the water in if you're going to boil it or or if you're going to go like really if you're going to be in a long-term survival situation and you're somewhere do you can you distill the water to uh to make it drinkable and potable hmm. Hmm. yeah yeah I, i'd lo love to chime in on this one uh uh kind of my uh I, and i've only shared this with with joel 
uh, from Forge, uh, I actually am working on a, a new filter because water is like the number one topic, you know, when you're talking survival. And I'm like, I got to get in on this one, you know. And so I've been doing a lot of studying and research, right? You know, if you were to right now look at my kit, um, you know, it's in stages. Uh, there are great filters out there that are lightweight, that you're, they're portable. Life straws are great. They're only good for about 289 gallons. Like you said, they're limited life. And then after that's done, then it's no good. Um, then you go to plan B. For me, plan B is uh, coffee filters. I carry a ton of them. They weigh nothing. And, uh, you know, you can use them from everything from washing your body to your butt to um, rinsing it out and filtering your water. I mean, it's amazing. and It's a fire starter. So it does a lot of different things. And for me, I always carry a uh, metal canteen. I don't do the plastic because boiling it, I mean, that's been used for ages, uh, killing all the pathogens that are uh, micro, you know, organisms that are in there. So boiling is probably the best way to do it. And so what I did is we were going to come out with something we call the forever filter because it never clogs. There's no filters in it. And we're just basically doing reverse osmosis uh, over fire, uh, but doing it in a pretty clever way that's portable. Because then it's no matter what water you find, even ocean water, we'll be able to boil it, and create a little mini um, rain cloud inside this tool. And before you know uh -huh. it, you have... 100% pure drinking water. Um, and right now we're processing about two cups um, every hour over an open flame. So it's going to work pretty cool. We're, we're just getting it developed right now and um, it'll be neat once we get it all done. But for me, you know, to talk to the listeners, it's, you know, there's a lot of products on the market that are inexpensive, um, but, you know, always have that filter the other little filters to get the big particulars out and then uh, aluminum cans, uh, metal uh, canteens are always the best. I, I never leave um, without those. Uh, yep. And, um, and some other things too, I'm just thinking about this, that um, a, a plastic bag you could use to get water. You tie a plastic bag to the end of a tree branch and you secure it. That bag is going to collect water from a tree um, from condensation and just, um, Again, osmo the tree breathing, it's going to collect some water, albeit it's not going to be a ton, but you mm. can get water from that. You could also make a solar still, especially you, Tim, being in Arizona, um, yeah. you can make a solar still in the desert with an aluminum can, some aluminum, or with some plastic or a tarp. Yeah. Um, so there's an, uh, other means to get water. If you have a sponge or if you have a piece of clothing, a, a, your coffee filter in the early morning dew, um, I'm thinking in a very arid environment, you could walk yeah. around and rub that coffee filter on the plants before sunrise and you could get some moisture. Again, it's not going to be a ton, but if you're, if you're parched and cotton mouth and you're in the desert and you're trying to survive, um, other means to potentially, you know, to get water so you don't die. Exactly. Yeah, there's one. Yeah. One other thing I like to add there is looking uh, or knowing where to look uh, for the moisture or the water. And obviously the plants and animals have a head start, but they're also good indicators. So you can kind of scan a landscape and get an idea. Of, you know, it's kind of like the cottonwoods down by the creek bed. Mm -hmm. uh, and start to look and see and you notice uh, particular features and those features can indicate water um, even from a distance. So you know, that's if you're in a place that doesn't have it all over. But in general, it's being able to read the environment as well. Yeah, and and even, uh, Doc, I got to second that too, like driving around, going to the um, the watering sources here in, in South Texas where, you know, it's 100 degrees plus daily. I can tell from, like, being in the car with friends, I'm like, okay, the river's down there. Because I can tell from the increase in vegetation, the uh, – the terrain is dropping down. I'm like, there is likely water down there. And again, for us to be good survivalists and or be prepared, we have to practice our, our bushcraft, our tradecraft, and be in the environment and recognize those things. And um goes back to what you said, Tim. You gotta you gotta practice and learn. And it um mm. 
you can't you can't do it sitting at your desk inside. You got to get outside and, and do it. <laughs> yeah, that's the biggest thing. The biggest thing. I mean, you could read all the manuals you want and 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 uh, watch enough videos, but if you don't actually go out there and accomplish it and do it um, when it's necessary, when it your life is in in danger and it really counts, you panic and panic probably kills more people than anything out in the wilderness. They, they get yep. scared. They lose their head. They got to be able to sit down, take a breath, figure out what they have, assess what they have, where they're at. And then at that point, make a plan. But uh, if you're not used to doing that, that's, that's when panic set, sets in and you start running around losing, you know, whatever calories you have, body moisture, it all goes out the door. And then, then you're in hurt. I mean, if mm-hmm. any of you have ever ever actually been dehydrated before, it hurts so bad. I, I've done an adventure race where it was a, a race, so it wasn't like I was surviving. I was trying to trying to get through the race. Basically, I, I was the very last guy that went. Actually, I, uh, full full disclosure, I I barely made it. I barely made it alive, but I got dehydrated throughout the whole thing, and every step I took, everything cramped up, and to the point where it put you on the ground. So dehydration is for me, once you've done there, been there and, and done it, it's like, okay, I've experienced it. Now it's not going to happen to me again. Let's figure out. So I don't go into the woods without proper, you know, uh, hydration and everything else, uh, as well as learning the skills. Yep. Yeah. I've, I've heat exhausted myself on many occasions during track yeah, think- training and it's not, uh, not fun. Yeah, what Tim said I think is is critical. He put himself in a situation in that adventure race to go to the limit. And I uh, I know a lot of folks who believe to be themselves to be ready, but they haven't actually forced themselves into that dangerous situation. And unless you do that, you never know what happens to yourself on the far side. You don't know what, you know, have you ever gone to the point of just total exhaustion or wanting to eat grass right. or you know, falling asleep while you're in the middle of an activity. And then you mm-hmm. learn how he responds and, and it's like your car. You kind of know what the noises mean. You know, yeah. I know how far I can push myself before it's dangerous. Yeah. You know yeah, how to pace yourself only, at that point. Not only your body, but like we're, we're saying our mind, like, um, mm-hmm. the last race I bit off, uh, same thing. My, our minds are, we're fine in hour one, hour two. How am I at hour 12 or 15 or at the end of a, an Ironman? Or it, again, this is all relative regardless of distance. It could be an adventure race. It could be a 5K for someone who just got off the couch. How is your mind going to respond to that um, with no sugar, no food, dehydrated? How are you going to respond when you're, you know, you're tired, you're hungry, and um, sorry, but your clit hurts. How are you going to respond and pull yourself up, pull yourself out of that situation? And like we've mentioned before, if you're if you're the leader of the group, how are you going to, you know, instead of focusing inward, we'd say it in the military all the time, you need to focus outward. And how are you going to do that 10 hours in or five days in or two weeks in um, that self-assessment, Tim, like you mentioned? That uh, mm-hmm. if you don't keep your if you don't keep your head, um, what's to stop you from walking in circles or walking off the edge of the cliff? You know things that um, I say it all the time. I'm like, oh man, I got the best bug out pack there is. I'm like, okay, when's the last time you've done a five mile hike with it? When's the last time you've done <laughs> a five mile hike um, up a hill? in a storm, in the rain, in the snow, in the extreme heat? When's the last time you practiced with your gear? You know? Uh, you bet. Uh, I love what you're saying about getting out there and testing it. I mean, the one thing I'll say is, so all my experiences I've had in my life are from making shows about people since I've been making TV shows for so long. And I, I did a show um, – many years ago about this uh, very innovative drug rehab program for kids where they did like primitive survival in order to get them clean. And uh, I was out there with them uh, filming and we had a scenario where 
you know, they we had some food, but we had to cook it, and you had to start a fire with a bow drill before you were able to cook it. And and I remember just being, uh, you know, it took me about six hours to start a fire. <laughs> That's how long it took. <laughs> and I thought it was just pure desperation that made me do it. But I, I really think you guys hit the nail on the head. Like, you, you have to have the gear, but you really have to have, you have to know how to use it. That's so true. Yeah. Don't be a mall ninja. Well, and for, for me, when I was, uh, you know, getting just really started and trying to get my family involved in the whole process as well, you know, there's a lot of great survival books that are out on the market. And uh, I wound up getting one uh, SAS uh, survival handbook. It has a lot of great doc, uh, you know, doc, um, uh, photographs and how to's and they were, I mean, they, they were really uh, detailed. And so we would just kind of, my sons and I, we would, you know, flip through it, close our eyes and then stop on a page just at random. And it'd be like, okay, that's today, whatever it is, if it's a deadfall trap or building a shelter or whatever, we're going to try to do, if it's, you know, not going out into a desert Island, you know, if it were possible, then we would practice it. And before you know it, it took, a year to get through the whole book, but, you know, we wound up practicing each one of those disciplines. And, uh, then it comes down to confidence. You know, once you've mastered whatever skill it was, you know, that, Hey, when it comes up, I've at least done it once. So maybe I did it three times if you're teaching. Uh, but if you've ever, you know, at least went out there, done it. And, you know, like you said, Oh, it's going to take me six hours to do this thing. Then, you know, okay. I'm going to stop a little bit earlier on my hike because I know it's going to take me six hours to, to uh, get this fire started versus going right till sun sun is setting, then going, oh, I better get a fire started. And you're in the middle of the night trying to figure out that there's no good tinder and, you know, trying to do it in, in the pitch dark is going to be really impossible. So it's all practice. Yeah. All I'm right. Glad it's having an option there. That's, I think, critical is – You've got a choice, whereas if you have never tried it, never read about it, you're just standing there staring, and you got nothing. So even if you saw a picture of it in a book and you never actually tried it, you're better as you have a choice. Uh, you know what? We I think we're going to have to do a part two of this because uh, we didn't get to – you know, food solutions or stored food. We didn't get to flashlights. We didn't get to solar power. We didn't get to the many uses of paracord, first aid, fishing, footwear. So uh, there's a lot more to go through, I guess. And um, we, we've been talking about an hour, and I, I'd like to wrap it up, actually. And thanks, Tim. That was really great to hear about your inventions and to have you part of the conversation. And uh, we'll be back with part two of Gear next week. You've been listening to the Survivalist Podcast with Mark Puhale and Matt Gould. Brought to you by Survival Cash, Ford Survival Supply, and TheBugOutRace.com. Please visit our website, TheSurvivalistPodcast.com. This show is produced by Chad Dugatz at The Hangar Studios in New York City. 